I'm Charles Overby, the uh, chairman of the Overby Center for Southern Journalism and Politics. I want to welcome all of you here. You know, I'm glad you're here. We're going to have a lot of fun. I'd pay uh, good money to come have a conversation just with Curtis Wilkie. But to have it with Curtis Wilkie and Stuart Stevens is a special privilege here. You all know Curtis. He's our inaugural fellow at the Overby Center, treasurer for Mississippi, not the treasurer, but a treasurer of Mississippi. <laughs> Stuart Stevens has a great Mississippi background. He grew up in Jackson. His father, Phineas Stevens, is uh, the oldest living member of the Student Hall of Fame, and he was honored here on campus about a month ago. Uh, so Stuart's uh, roots in Mississippi go way back, but you know, I'm sorry to say that he studied in Oxford, but it was a different Oxford. It was in uh, um, Oxford University in Great Britain. Uh, but Stuart's come a long way, done a lot of things. We know him, and he's here today is wearing his political hat, but we know him also because he's distinguished uh, travel writer. He and David Cruz spent how many months together in China? Too many. Too many. <laughs> he wrote a great book about night train to Turkestan. And uh, if you read that book, you'd say they both were crazy to have gone. He's written a number of other books. He's done TV shows, movies. Uh, he went to the UCLA Film School. He's a Renaissance man, which isn't what everybody would expect out of the Republican strategist, chief strategist for Mitt Romney. Welcome here today. Thank Good, you. Ray. Glad to have you here. Good to be here. Um, Start, let's start out with something easy. Uh, uh, my Good. understanding of you in terms of politics is that you started off with Thad Cochran. Is that right or wrong? Or? No, I, I worked um, in, in Thad's first race uh, when he ran um, and uh, also worked uh, in a, a guy named John Henson's race who had, uh, was running for that congressional race for both of those. Um, and uh, I really didn't have anything to do with him winning. He won um, in, in spite of anything I did. Uh, but it was, uh, it, Thad was the first Republican elected statewide um, since Reconstruction, I guess. Uh, and I've always uh, been a great admirer of his. So why would a man who had so many different talents and passions want to go into politics? Well, in my case, um, I was always interested in uh, politics, film, and writing. And I discovered that uh, people would pay me to make television commercials for them. And no one wanted to pay me to write, no one wanted to pay me to do any film work. And I could go and work in campaigns and make commercials, and I could do it kind of like migrant labor work. And I would have time to try to write. And then later, when I got to a point where people actually would pay me to write, or work some in television. Um, I, at that point, had sort of gotten hooked where I really liked campaigns. I liked how different it was than writing. I liked that you did it with people, not solitary. And I liked um, that you won or lost. I liked winning a lot more. Um, and I liked um, just the, the, the entire sort of endeavor of it, um, being involved in something bigger than yourself. We have aspiring politicians and political writers in this audience. What's the secret to a good TV commercial? Oh, I think that um, it has to have a logic to it, that, that, that it has to have a, a rationale to it um, that is consistent with the rationale of the campaign. Um, I'm a big believer that, that you really need to know how a campaign ends to know how it should begin. Sort of like uh, arguments in front of a jury, which really is what I think campaigns are. That you need to know what your, your closing argument is that you're gonna make to the jury before you begin. That when you get up and it's, ladies and gentlemen, in this course of this campaign, I'm going to tell you, you know, X, Y, and Z. And at the end, you're gonna know the following. Um, and unless you can do that, you don't really know where you're going to end up. Um, and the best campaigns are those that, the best campaign ads are those that people see and they resonate as something that reinforces a point that would be consistent with that, which is part of that larger argument that you're trying to make. 
Hey, one of the great ironies uh, and great stories of American uh, success is that these two guys, Mississippians through and through, uh, were in Massachusetts of all places. Uh, and you were successfully in Governor Wells' campaign and Curtis was a successful political reporter for the Boston Globe. Uh, tell us, Curtis, about your first uh, getting to know Stuart and how that arc developed. Well, I met Stuart in Boston, it would have been 1990, and I was covering uh, the governor's race. And the governor's race was going to be so good that they had lured me back from doing overseas stuff. Uh, and I was willing to do it because it was potentially you know, a wonderful story, it was. So we had a crazy man running as a Democratic candidate who was president of Boston University, John Silber, surprisingly won the nomination. And then you had this patrician, a very typical Republican candidate, but in a very Democratic state, Bill Weld, who Stewart was uh, handling his media. And uh, uh, I met Stewart, and we, we knew we were both Mississippians, what uh, uh, really convinced me this was an interesting guy. He gave me a couple of copies of his travel books and they were wonderful. You know, so many of these uh, political figures don't even read books. This is a guy who wrote uh, <laughs> a very, very funny, you know, it's uh, your, your classic good travel writing. It's very good. So he didn't write about, you know, the comfort of uh, being on the road and this is the best hotel, but he wrote about uh, you know, danger and discomfort and weird things, and uh, it's it's a, it's a it's a it's an interesting genre of writing. And and as I said, you know, even if he is a Republican, he's an interesting uh, interesting guy. And uh, so we, you know, we've been friends ever since. But I haven't seen him in uh, in years. So I'm glad to glad to see you again. Get you on our campus. So how does all this lead to your relationship with Mitt Romney? Oh, um, I uh, had worked in Massachusetts, you know, did the Governor Wells race and then uh, Governor Salucci who followed Governor Will. Um, I uh, went out to um, try to convince, uh, successfully try to convince Governor Romney, uh, then Mitt Romney, uh, to run for governor in 2002. I, I was successful in that. I was unsuccessful in getting him to hire me, um, but I, he won that race. Um, and uh, he then ran for president in 2008. Um, I ended up getting hired, my firm ended up getting hired sort of late in that process. It's kind of complicated. Um, and I, I really, didn't have much relationship with him before that, and we were hired sort of in an advisory role um, late, like for a presidential race, like September of 2007. Um, and then we, he lost, and then I really didn't think he was gonna run again. You know, this idea that he immediately started to plan to run again after 2008 is, uh, to my mind, completely wrong, you know? He wanted to write this book, um, and, uh, and uh, I used to go down and see him when he was uh, working on this book. He, you know, they did a very American thing. They sold the house where they brought up the kids because, you know, they were empty nesters now. Um, and he'd always wanted to have this, you know, dream of living uh, on the ocean. They got this place uh, in California. And he really threw himself into this book and uh, was, I think, happy as could be working on this book. Um, and I think running and losing was very liberating to him. Um, and he's a, you know, he's a very happy person. You know, he's, he's, he's someone who um, was, I think, running for the right reasons and lost and worked his heart out for McCain. And I think he thought that the economic conditions of the country would bounce back a lot sooner than they did. Um, and it's not that he didn't think he'd ever run again, but was surprised that things didn't get as well, better sooner. So I think sort of the game came back to him. Um, and that's how he ended up, uh, ended up running. 
Did you and he think it was a foregone conclusion that he would win the Republican primary? No. no. Or tell us about who you. No, I think it was very about. unlikely that he would win the Republican. So primary. who were you worried the most about? Well, you have to remember we were behind everybody. At one time, I mean, uh, we were behind people that weren't in the race. Pro pro probably, you know, we would have both been behind Curtis if Curtis had switched parties. <laughs> um, you know, wh what do we know about the Republican Party? It's uh, increasingly evangelical, southern, and populist. W what do we know about Mitt Romney? Um, and it's, I think, a real testament to his political skill that he was able to win the nomination. And, you know, these things always look easy in retrospect, but um, he didn't have a geographic base in the party. And, um, in, in some ways, he didn't have an ideological base, a hard ideological base, though he's, he's very much a conservative. Um, and it was a very tough primary. I think that there's a lot of um, lack of appreciation for how much some of these candidates in the Republican primary were in sync with the voters of the Republican primary. In many ways, uh, someone like Rick Santorum uh, was more in sync with the Republican primary electorate than Hillary Clinton was with the Democratic primary electorate. And Hillary Clinton was a, a pro-war senator in so much as she supported the war in Iraq in an anti-war primary. Um, and it was, it was a, a very difficult primary. And we, we always thought it would be a very difficult primary. But then these tend to be very difficult primary. And he never, we never assumed that he was a front runner or thought of it that way. Well, you had to fight every step of the way, and a lot of the uh, negative ads against him came back to you in the general election. You had time now to think about that primary process, mm -hmm. which was so brutal. Uh, do you have any thoughts about how the primary process should be changed uh, for Republicans? Yeah, it's. You know, the, the Republican Party has just done this interesting study, um, growth and opportunity study or something that they call it, which I, I thought was very interesting that, that, that uh, the party did this because it's, uh, it's unusual that a party will do that uh, with the same management that has just conducted a party. Usually something like that is done by people that come in to prove that the people that have been running the party uh, had made a lot of mistakes. Um, uh, but it, it, it's, it was a really serious, I think, smart attempt to look at the party and to look at the process and to ask tough questions. And look, there aren't any easy answers to these things. Um, but I think that a lot of things that a lot of people would think would be logical conclusions. One, that this process goes on for too long. Um, I mean, we had the, the first debate in, well, the first debate was in, I think, April of 2011. That's crazy. Um, we had something like, well, there, there are 20 debates in all. We had something like a dozen debates before anybody voted. Um, it, it, look, I don't have a, you know, I don't have an ax to grind here. The debates were very positive for, for Governor Romney. I mean, I think he had the best string of debates that anybody's ever had in modern politics. He's, he's, he's a fantastic debater. Um, you can make the case that he won the nomination through the debates. So, um, but um, that process, I think, began with the best of intentions and sort of spun out of control. And I have opinions that really, it's not really the media's role to be putting on these debates. They should be put on by, like, this center. And, and, and journalists should be asking questions. But to have branded debates, to me, seems very odd. To have a CNN branded debate um, as a campaign event, it's just we don't have, like, what next? Like a CNN branded bus tour or a CNN brand? Uh, it's just odd. You know, the, the role of the media is to be to cover events, not to put them on. Um, and there was so much competition between different media outlets for these debates and to make the debates more spectacular that I think it just sort of brought down the process. 
um, and it becomes a ratings war rather than a process that is about trying to illuminate who is best qualified to be president. So do you think that'll be changed next time? I, the problem is, uh, who's, what, what is the organizing principle? How do you do this? You know, finally, out of frustration, and you, you, you know, you guys were involved in this, you know, um, the only thing that could bring together Republicans and Democrats uh, was frustration with the League of Women Voters and the debate process for the general election to come with um, the commission on, uh, uh, on uh, debates, presidential commission on debates. I think that you're gonna have both an open seat in Democrat and Republican primaries. That means you have potential to have 40, 50, 50 debates. It's crazy. And I, I think that we'd be well served to try to, both parties, to have some sort of commission that would try to bring order to this process. It's very difficult to do, um, because as long as candidates say that they will show up to get attention for debates, and as long as you have uh, people saying that they'll provide an outlet and a, ca and a camera, it's very, very difficult to, to try to get your arms around that. Um, so I, I think that that would, some way to try to bring order to that would, would help. Um, and I think to try to have the process end sooner. One of the things that, that people don't, I think, fully grasp is the impact of super PACs on elongating this process. You know, campaigns never end because people want them to end, because campaigns want that campaign to end. Campaigns end because you run out of money. And, you know, 99% of the time. And that, reality has changed with the advent of super PACs. Because if you have one person that will give a campaign $5 million to keep it going, that campaign will not end. And so the normal process that a campaign does not do well and therefore dries up funds and therefore withdraws has been completely changed. So had this process been in effect in 2008, you surely would not have had two-person debates as quickly as you did between Hillary and Obama. I mean, you would have had, you know, a bunch of people staying in those debates. And four years from now, three and a half years from now, three years from now, you're going to have debates with the Democratic candidates in all likelihood that are going to go on for a long time because all, there will be super PACs under the current system uh, Super PACs backing each of these Democratic candidates. And they'll keep those campaigns, they may come in third in Iowa, fourth in Iowa, fifth in Iowa, fourth, fifth, sixth in, in, in New Hampshire. They'll stay alive in all likelihood. And they'll, they'll stay alive for the debates. So trying to get down to debate amongst those people who might actually be president of the United States, is gonna be very tough. Um, and I just don't think that that serves people well when you really want to see the people who are going to be possibly president of the United States. Stuart, back to the Romney campaign. Uh, was it nationally ever winnable? You're running against an incumbent who's got hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, he's got a number of issues that seem to fall in his favor. Anything you could have done to have won that campaign? Sure. I, I, listen, I think I've, I've sort of so it's a really good question. It's a really smart question. Um, incumbent presidents usually win. Incumbent presidents, only once has an incumbent president lost when they are the first, and you're in the first term of the first term of a new party that hasn't been, that it comes into power. Um, it's very difficult. Um, now, I think, you know, we, we made a lot of mistakes in the campaign, but every campaign I've ever been involved in, we made a lot of mistakes. We made a lot of mistakes in both Bush campaigns. What tends to happen is when you win these things, you, you look smarter, and when you lose, you look dumber. And um, I think there are always, uh, moments you'd like back and, and different factors you'd, you'd like to be able to, different 
plays you'd like to be able to run over. Um, but I, I think it was, uh, absolutely, I think the campaign was winnable. It was always difficult, um, but I, I think it was uh, definitely winnable. Was your high point the first debate? Yes, I think so. Um, you know, the problem that is difficult for people to appreciate because, again, the confusion of the super PACs is how much campaign to campaign we were being outspent on television. Um, from the time we won the primary until the time we were able to get the nomination and access general election dollars, we were outspent on television um, 3.4 to 1. So that means in these states like Ohio, they're running four spots to every one spot. And what you just know from a governor's race, that's very, very difficult to kind of break through that. And we borrowed money to try to overcome that, but um, still, it was very much uh, difficult to do so. So very quickly, our, we realized that this, the strategy that we had to deal with was trying to stay alive and viable until the first debate. And to then try to have a breakthrough moment at that first debate and then close strong from October. The strategy for the Obama campaign was to try to kill Romney uh, before the first debate so that the race would be out of play. I think clearly that strategy didn't work. The race was still in play after the first debate. It's very, very difficult to do that in the first debate. I mean, most times, I, I know a lot of these debates, debates usually don't matter. I mean, somebody will have a good debate, a bad debate, but it doesn't matter. So you've got to really run the table in a debate um, for it to have a measurable impact. And um, uh, the governor was, uh, uh, we, we had a good night. And, and uh, it helped that there was an unusually, just for the scheduling, long period between the first debate and the second debate. Um, so that, that was, I, I think, probably a campaign high point. And low point, uh, Hurricane losing. Sandy, or losing. well, losing, losing, but the hurricane, uh, your, uh, the, the video from the fundraiser uh, where he laid it to 47 percent on it. Um, those are very different because of the 47 percent. You know, that happened, uh, I think, September 19th. That happened on a Monday night um, that came out. That Wednesday, two days later, uh, the governor had a big appearance in Miami at, uh, uh, on Univision. That was a big Hispanic forum, uh, which he was preparing for. And, you know, Governor Romney's the sort of person who very much is, like, uh, future-oriented. Um, and he was completely focused on, okay, what's, let's don't dwell on this. This didn't, you know, as he said, this didn't, you know, shouldn't have said this didn't come out right, but what can we do about it? And that was the next big event you would have is a Hispanic forum. And it's very remarkable the degree to which he could focus, come back, and he had just a tremendous night in front of the, uh, Hispanic Forum. I think he did much better than the president did in front of the same forum. Um, so that gave you an action to focus on. All you could do is, we can't unring this bell, but let's just try to get better and, and really have a good night at the Hispanic Forum. The storm, there was nothing you could do. No. Um, I mean, we went from having these giant sweeping rallies, you know, with record-sized crowds, which, but, you know, being able to drive a message. Uh, to sitting in hotel rooms. And there, there wasn't anything you could do. And to do anything, to try to force it, would be just to make something worse. Um, so one, there was an action, and the other was much more frustrating. Yeah. Plus, it was horrible what was happening to watch. I mean, there was, it was, you know, heartbreaking to watch this stuff. So you're watching this and you feel, too, it's just horrible. No, no storm, no loss? No, I don't think you can say that uh, at, at all. Um, this, because you don't, there's no control. You don't know what would have happened if there hadn't been a storm. 
Um, you know, a, a close presidential race you know, was close. It's, it's like an NBA game. It, it does come down to ball, a close NBA game. Uh, or, you know, the, the final game that Ole Miss was in. It, it comes down to an NCAA. It comes, it comes down to control at the end. And it took away our ability to have that control. Now, who's to say if we hadn't had a storm, we, we, we could have had a bad run the last couple of days. You know, we could have said something we shouldn't have said or had a, you know, the, the president could have had a great run. There's no control there. But uh, in our internal polling, we ask a question, who do you think is going to win and who has the momentum? And there was a 40-point shift in that internal within three days, um, which was depressing. <laughs> but there's nothing you can do about it. Mm -hmm. um, we've never had in our history uh, a major national disaster six days before presidential election. Did it have an impact? Sure, of course. Your take uh, several months out from the race on money in the campaign mm -hmm. maybe is a little different now than it was before? Yeah, um, you know, I've had a chance to really go back and look at a lot of data and, you know, also know a lot more about the uh, Obama campaign because, you know, we spent a lot of time talking to the Obama campaign. And I've got to say, you know, they've been extraordinarily gracious and, um, you know, it, it's at a certain point, you know, you get up there, you try to, you know, beat each other's brains out. But at a certain point, you do have some awareness that you're very fortunate to be in a system and in a country where you can settle this at the ballot box and then come together and try to work together. And um, you can't go through something as... Um, grueling as these things are, um, and see what it takes out of the candidates and their families, and not just have tremendous respect for anyone who will go through that process. And I, I have nothing but respect for the president and, and his team around them, and they've been extraordinarily gracious. Um, it, the impact of not having federal funding in this campaign is something that um, I think has been under appreciated for a lot of reasons. You know, just to go back on history, uh, since 1976, we had a system where for the general election, every candidate took federal funding. You got that literally from a check from the Treasury Department when you walked off the stage from accepting the nomination. That later would be a certified check from a person with the Treasury Department. And that amount would be calculated among the number of registered voters there were. For the Bush campaign, 2004, I think it had gone to $82 million or something. That's all the money you can spend. The parties can spend money. But it freed the candidates from having to raise money post-convention. It's why conventions became so late. You know, in 2000, we had the, the Republican convention in July, and then we sort of had the not-so-brilliant realization, we're going to get the same amount of money whenever we have this convention? Wouldn't it be better to have less time to spend the same amount of money? So we pushed the convention back in 2004. You have to have it by law 60 days before the election at the latest. So Obama in 2008, and I think this is part of his negative legacy, frankly, uh, after pledging to say that he would stay in the federal system, because everybody stayed in the federal system, he changed his mind and opted out of the federal system. And if you read David Pluff's book, The Audacity to Win, which is a very good book, um, David basically says they did it because they knew they could do it. And I think that he was uniquely positioned in the sort of oh, total universe of the press and public opinion that he could get away with it. I don't think anybody else could have. I don't think Hillary Clinton could have, but he did. And they raised over $700 million. Um, that then gave him four years to raise $1.2 billion. We'd never had an incumbent president have four years to raise that money since 1976. The last incumbent president who did it was Nixon. Um, that was a huge advantage for them. So we emerged from the primary basically broke like everybody does. Um, our cash on hand in April of 2012 was, a, for television, was about 4.2 million. Uh, they had over 128 million. And, you know, they didn't have a primary, just as Bush didn't have a primary in 2004. Um, but it just gave them such a huge advantage. 
And the only money that, that the, the Romney campaign could spend on television was money that we were raising under the primary system, under primary dollars, which is very difficult for people to grasp. Once you are seen as winning the primary, to then go out and try to raise money for the primary. People go, well, you've already won the primary. Why do you want me to give you money for the primary? Um, it's just a huge advantage. Um, I don't think that the impact of not having a federal funding system in place or some other system has been fully grasped by people. This incumbent president raised $1.2 billion. The next incumbent, be it Democrat, Republican, Independent, is you can figure they're going to raise $2 billion. So that means the challenger will come out of a competitive primary, usually, always, facing an incumbent president with $2 billion. You're going to beat that person? I don't think it's going to be tough. You're going to have to have something really extraordinary happen. So um, I think that the law of unintended consequences, as it often does, is sort of kicked in. I mean, in essence, I think we've come close to abolishing a four-year term under the system. And if you go back and when you look at when the, the law was passed in 76, part of it was anti-corruption after Watergate and the abuses of fundraising on you know, the Nixon. But part of it was a realization that absent corruption, an incumbent president had such ability to raise money that it, the best for the sort of body politic was to have a federal funding system. And you know, once the genie's out of the bottle, how do you get it back in? It's very difficult. Um, but I think that and now we have the Citizens United decision that, about money. But I think we're in a particularly bad place. We're sort of one foot on the dock and one foot on the boat. And uh, it would endeavor us all to try to come to a better place so that these candidates don't have to spend the kind of money, the kind of time they are doing to raise money. You know, in a rough of the envelope calculation from winning the primary until the election, I would say Governor Romney had to spend 60 to 70 percent of his time raising money. So that might surprise people in the audience who know that we had lots of independent uh, raising of money. Your post-election analysis of the super PACs. Oh, um, it's, it's, it's very interesting. Um, you know, I think there were some superb, brilliant Super PAC ads made on behalf of the, the Republican side for, 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 for Governor Romney. The problem is, by law, they can't coordinate with campaigns. And, you know, what we, you learn in politics very quickly is it's not just running an ad that affects people, particularly in a presidential race when you, everybody's paying attention to you, but it's when you run an ad, you give a speech, you have an event, you have your press, and you do, you know, what we call rollouts, and you do all of this together that that creates a momentum that you can drive a message. If you look kind of what the president's doing on a gun control issue, you know, all of this stuff together, you drive a message. The super PACs can't do that because they're completely separate. And their efforts on television, just you know, regardless of how brilliant the ads are, just by nature, weren't, cannot be as effective as ads made by campaign. I mean, it, it, it just is a tremendous disadvantage not to be able to have that money inside a campaign to spend. And 40% of the ads made on behalf of Romney were made by the Romney campaign. 60% were made by super PACs. 80% of the campaign ads made by the Obama campaign were made by the Obama campaign. That's a huge qualitative difference um, that I don't think when all of this was going on, we fully grasp. Because a lot of these ads were fantastic. And you look at it and you go, wow, it's a great ad. But just the way in which they would be talking about one thing and then we would be talking about something else, the ability to respond. You know, they had no idea what we were going to do in two weeks. It's, 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 it's just not as effective. Stuart, post-election, uh, the Republican Party reminds me a bit of the Democratic Party in the early 70s. Uh, after defeat, a lot of backbiting, divisiveness, uh, kind of a, a drift. You, you had a, 
op-ed piece in the Washington Post mm -hmm. uh, earlier this year, and among other things, you said uh, a Republican renaissance will inevitably be driven by policy. What, what, what are you talking about? You didn't have enough space to develop that in your Well, you piece. assume I know what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> It's easier to just hint that you know. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, I, look, I, I go back to this. I mean, in 2004, there was a lot of talk that Republicans had, were building a majority that would not be challenged. And, you know, inside Bush world, I can tell you, most of us never believed it for a second. And, you know, we were very aware of the fact that you know, had 70,000 people changed their votes in Ohio, we would have been a bunch of idiots. Um, and, you know, there's some rumor that we lost a popular vote in 2000. So we never believed uh, any of this talk that there was some uh, Republican uh, inevitability building. And I don't believe now that there's a Democratic inevitability. Look, you know, Romney won by um, about two points, majority of voters over 30. What do we know about the country? It's getting older. Um, I think that, that the part of the problem that the uh, Republican Party has um, is uh, we are a victim of our success to a certain degree. You know, kind of some of the classic Republican issues are no longer factors. It's been a, this has been a building problem. Um, uh, the foreign policy issues of, uh, you know, obviously the Cold War, then building in to success, uh, you know, uh, war on terror has been uh, present, has carried on a lot of Bush policies, has been observed by many. Um, that's not moving a lot of voters now. Um, I think that's in many ways a good thing. I mean, it's obviously a good thing. It's good that uh, we're not feeling threatened. Um, taxes. Uh, you know, there was a great Bush move to have fewer people pay taxes. We thought this was a very positive social development, that if you could raise the level at which people did not have to pay taxes. If a family of four making $40,000 could not pay federal income tax, we thought this was positive. Um, you know, I'll, I'll leave it to more, more informed policy people, but there's some reason to believe, and some will argue, that when you reach that it's, it's better for, for, even for more people to feel more invested, even if it's at minute levels. Um, we, it was obviously part of, of, of our, our Bush efforts um, to encourage everyone to buy a home. And you know, we all saw that that had a law of unintended consequences, you know, that, that, it, that it happened. Um, but that was, a, that was a movement. You know, we, it was you know, part of what grew out of Margaret Thatcher's ownership society. Um, these were, this was part of compassion and conservatism. Um, and we need to, as a, as a party, come up with what is it that we are going to be able to do to address that which will make people feel that the party is speaking to their needs and their, their deep feel, felt passions about America. Um, and I don't think we're far away. Um, I, I think one of the great phenomena of our time now is we, we live in a very Dickinsonian moment of the best and worst of times where stock market is at all time high, and we have levels of poverty not seen since the 1970s. Um, the number of people that have gone on food stamps in the last four and a half years has increased by 16 million. 16 million people. Uh, and it's continuing to rise. Um, a new study came out last week that showed that 46% of the people living in New York City qualify now under the poverty level. It's, it, this is extraordinary. Uh, 
the unemployment numbers go down, but the dirty little secret of the unemployment numbers, is, as you know, is it's a function of how many people are looking for work. And if you quit looking for work for four weeks, you drop off those rolls. You become a non-person. But you don't, it's not like a Star Wars episode where you're put into an evaporator. You're still there. And these people are still out there. There's fewer people working full time in America today than there were four years ago. And, you know, it's, it's the tragedy of people getting s fewer jobs, full time jobs, that are quality jobs. And that, to me, income disparity is, uh, uh, inequality has gone up. It was actually going down a little under Bush. Um, and yet we seem to be talking a lot about guns and gay marriage. I, I think that's uh, inevitable that the conversation is going to come back to these base economic issues. Because I, I think that there is a unique phenomenon that, that there are fewer and fewer reporters for the larger economic reasons. They're more and more based that dominate the conversation in Washington and New York. Seven out of 10 of the wealthiest counties in America, which is to say the wealthiest counties in the world, are in Washington, D.C. now. I mean, it's like Abu Dhabi. <laughs> and New York is New York. And I think that that affects the coverage and affects the mood. And I think that it is, uh, there's an underappreciation for what is happening across the country. So, you know, all through this campaign, I think some of the best economic coverage came out of the Des Moines Register, came out of the Tampa Tribune, came out of these, these smaller papers, because I think the reporters there are less isolated. You know, they, they have carpools with people that have lost their homes. They know people that have, have, uh, have difficulty getting jobs. You know, they're, 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 they know people that can't sell their homes. And so I think that still, that, that who's going to win the next presidential race are going to be those that can speak to this great economic um, stress that so many Americans are still feeling. Um, and if wh whoever gets there first with the most compelling message, and part of that reflects national debt because we're not going to be able to buy our way out of this problem. I mean, I think, you know, one of the realities of the president's uh, lack of success uh, with gun control legislation is a lot of reasons, and I, I wrote a piece, I do this column now for the Daily Beast, and I wrote a piece about this, but one of the reasons is, you know, we don't have earmarks anymore. I mean, there was a time he probably could have gotten these votes by largesse, but we don't have the money to, well, A, we don't have earmarks, B, we don't have the money anymore. And I think that that is going to change the conversation. And um, it's, uh, I, I feel uh, optimistic about Republicans' ability to speak to this. Um, I want to go to the audience for a question, but let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. How would President Romney have uh, done anything differently in these months of 2013 from President Obama? Well, I never want to speak for, for, um, for Governor Romney, um, and I, I never did in the campaign. Um, but you know what he campaigned on, and you know... But I, 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 do, I do, so I don't, I don't want to be presumptuous, but I do think you can close your eyes and imagine a president who, on, this president mentioned jobs three times in his inaugural address. Um, you can imagine a president who would have focused as the greatest challenge on that we are in the economic crisis and would have convened governors and asked them, what do I have to do that your state can grow jobs? And this is what governors do, I mean, successful governors. It's, it's not particularly historic or glamorous in a lot of cases. It's what impediments do we have to get you able to hire more people in your state? And you know, it's what governors say to companies. What do I need to do to get you to move to my state? To me, that's what a president should be doing. And I think that Governor Romney 
is very attuned to that economic um, world. Um, and I think that he would have focused his uh, extraordinary attention uh, on that economic crisis and on the budget in a, in a different way. Um, you know, uh, as Curtis can speak to, um, being a Republican in Massachusetts is, you know, you, you got to learn how to get things done pretty quickly. And, you know, no Republican ever muscled his way into anything in Massachusetts. Um, and he would have had a lot more Republicans working with him in Washington than he ever did in Massachusetts. Um, and uh, I think that he, he would have entered this argument in a different place. Um, and I think you would have seen a very different focus. You know, President Obama, and I say this not disrespectfully or disparagingly, he's very much a cause politician. Many conservatives are that way too. He is motivated by causes. He is not someone like Ed Rendell, for instance, who is a meat and potatoes economic uh, steward. You know, he didn't go into politics uh, to have uh, 2.5 economic growth. You know, he went into politics to bend history's arc. And you, there's something about that that is very compelling to people. Uh, but at this particular moment, when we're still suffering through the greatest economic crisis since the Depression, I think it's fair to ask, uh, does the moment demand a different focus? Let's go to the audience. Yes, sir. And we have, uh, we'll just speak up. The microphones may arrive at some point. Yes, sir. One for ten? Yeah, the one for ten. Frankly, that's the moral of the question. <laughs> well, you know, I, I'll give you a little. Let me ask one more thing. Did he do that? Did he really believe that, or did he have to do that because primary voters were very conservative? Well, I'll give you a little backstory to that. Um, raise your hand question should never be asked in a debate. Yeah. It's the stupidest thing. And, um, it goes to this debate question. And before that, all the candidates, you know, kind of talking about it, said, look, if they ask those questions, no one's going to raise their hand. <laughs> if they ask a raise your hand question, everybody agrees. Let's just don't raise our hands. And you saw that didn't work. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think that when you're asking a very simplistic question in a in a forum that deserves more sophistication, it's really an unfair question. And you're really asking a litmus test. You're not asking, would you really, as a serious question, would you do one for 10? You're asking, uh, this, is, this is a symbolic question. When it becomes raise your hand, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a symbolic question. Are you for more spending or tax cuts? Which do you believe? You're not trying to get a serious policy answer here. That's not how you ask a question like that. You don't have to raise your hand. It's like, it's like asking, you know, um, it's, just, it's a silly question. And you're, you're asking uh, skins or shirts. Are you for raising taxes or for spending, cutting spending? And that's what you got. You know, are you instinct, or do you believe as a government we need to focus more on cutting spending or raising taxes? And that's, that's the kind of answer you've got. But it, 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 it's, it shows, I tell you what I would have liked to have, have asked in a Democratic primary, a question like that. Uh, what level do you think you should raise taxes on people? I'm going to keep going. $20,000 a year? Everybody raise their taxes. $30,000? $40,000? Raise your hand when you think I need to raise your taxes. $50,000? $60,000? $70,000? $80,000? When do you think they would have started raising their hands? 
Who would have been the first to raise their hands and say, I want to raise your taxes? I don't know. It would have been an interesting exercise. Because the first person that raised their hands would have been the first person to say they want to raise taxes. It's, it's, well, I think he believed, he saw the question for what it was. This is a question, do I believe in cutting spending or raising taxes? I believe in cutting spending more. It's not a sophisticated question. You're not going to get a, raise your hand. It's, 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 it's such a, like, why that whole debate process? And let me tell you, afterwards, I think that was the last time they asked a raise your hand questions. Because afterwards, the, you know, all these campaigns, you know, went to and said, look, you do this again, you know, we really are, you know, do not do this. This is just dumb. It's insulting to us. It's insulting to you. Um, and it was one of the few times everybody kind of came together. I said, we're not, we actually can talk, mm. ask us questions. So raise your hand if you have a question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. You mean the actual numbers? So implicit in that is maybe also you weren't tough enough on Obama. Why weren't you tougher on Obama? Um, well, they're kind of two. Um, we well, we did some. We did we did we did both. Um, there. We, we test this stuff exhaustively, talking to people. And it's very interesting because when you use numbers, X number of people, um, they don't, pe people don't know how many people are in the country. Pe I, well, this is generalizations, but you know, you, you, people get lost in the, I'm, I'm not saying that I'm not making a judgment, not, but um, it's, we, we would tr make different commercials and then also just talk to people about different ways to do this. And it, it's big numbers people tend to get lost in, we found. It's one of the reasons we have such a huge national debt because you know, people can't grasp the numbers. And we made individual state ads that would talk about the number of people in that state that have lost their jobs. And we found that people could grasp that more. Number of people working when President Obama took office in Ohio, number of people today, that worked better um, the element of talking about the larger unemployment that percentage is that you want to be relevant to a national conversation. So you want what you're saying to be relevant to what is being said on the news as well, um, which is why we use third party as much as we could. Um, you know, there was a famous Scott Pelley clip of him saying, you know, the worst economic recovery since the Depression, which we used over and over and over again. Um, one thing we found is you really couldn't tell people about the economy, that they felt whatever they felt. It's very interesting. Um, it, it, if they felt bad about the economy, you couldn't make them feel good. And we had a red team and a blue team. So we had people making pro-Obama ads. And the Obama people ran into the same thing. You know? um, 
it's sort of if you were wet, you couldn't tell them you're, you're, you're really dry. And if you were dry, you couldn't tell them you were wet. You had to take what they felt and try to form that to an opinion. Um, and it's because the economy was something that people experienced so much every day of their lives that it was just they felt that they know more than you do about the economy. And it was just so part of their, they would argue with you about it. Time for one or two more questions. Yes, ma'am. One question. Is it true that the bill of the census was mere putting subordinates to the office of president? I have no idea. No idea. I have no idea. Well, was the Bureau of Census moved to be under the president before the election? And Stewart said he doesn't know. David? Pardon? Yeah, I, I have no idea. Um, well, I think there's tremendous economic forces at work that are not positive for the coverage. I, I, I don't, you know, I tend not to look at this as bias at all, um, but more economic forces. I mean, there are fewer reporters, first of all, it's just a fact, you know. And their experience level, for the most part, is uh, much less than it used to be. And, and I don't think uh, any of that is, is positive. I mean, it used to be that you had reporters covering who had uh, worked their way up had uh, to a presidential campaign. This past pr presidential campaign, uh, and the, the political reporters, a lot of them, were very inexperienced. Um, and I think that's largely due to economic factors. Um, and I think it affects the texture and uh, context of the coverage. Um, and I don't think it's some vast left-wing conspiracy. I think it's true for more conservative papers. I think it's just at a time when there's so much economic pressure. It's, it's not, it's not, I mean, look, how was the Boston bombing covered? Different than it had ever been before for all these different factors. I mean, it's just a very different world. There was a question in the back. Yes, sir. Well, two, two, two things. It's an interesting question. Two things. Um, uh, you know, the, the Romney campaign, in a voter contact, by any of the metrics, like door-to-door -door contacts or any of the contacts, uh, far exceeded any other Republican campaign. Uh, we were, you know, in Ohio or any of these states. We were over double the number of contacts the Bush campaign made. Um, we had a, a very ambitious data system uh, for voter turnout on election day that didn't work very well. So I, I, I think it sort of exists in two worlds here where we did a lot better job than anybody else had ever done. We didn't do as good a job as we wanted to do. That's because we didn't have enough time and money to beta test it to a degree that would have been ideal to do. Now, going into that, all our data guys and girls were saying, this, you know, we're doing something that's never been done before. And you know, it's kind of like they were saying, we can't tell you this rocket's going to really, you know, we really should be running a lot more tests on it. I mean, we just didn't have the time or money to do it. I mean, we were attempting to do something that the Obama campaign had had six years to perfect. <laughs> so um, it, 
th there were definite problems with it. They still kind of muscled their way to do a lot more than anybody else. Um, I, I look at the Obama turnout operation and I kind of, it gets a lot of credit. I, I kind of scratch my head on this because, you know, they turned out fewer voters than they did four years earlier. So at face value, you'd say, well, if they had such a great turnout operation, why'd they turn out fewer voters than they did four years earlier? Whereas you say, okay, well, maybe overall turnout's down. Well, no, I mean, more people voted for Romney than voted for McCain. The only areas in which they turned out more voters were uh, Hispanic voters and African-American voters. To me, when I look at that, that leads me to the conclusion that they're underselling the power of their message. I, I, I don't mean this as a negative for the Obama campaign, it's really a compliment to their message. That I think that they had a very powerful message that resonated with African Americans and Hispanic voters. And I think that it is somehow, um, I'm quite sure what the word is, dismissive of that message to say, well, it was just turnout. Because they had the same turnout mechanism for all aspects of their voters. They turned out fewer younger voters, they turned out fewer senior voters, they turned out. So, I'm not sure I'm buying, you know, they had a, a lot of the same turnout mechanism in 2010 when, you know, Democrats lost. So um, I think that there's definite data gains that an incumbent party has, the day, advantages that they have. I think a lot of that comes because they have the huge mechanism of the party to be able to work with. You have the DNC that can work with an incumbent president and you can have you know, hundreds of people working with this data. And we did this in the Bush campaign. It was a huge advantage. That will be somewhat equalized now because you're not going to have an incumbent president um, in four years. And it'll be very interesting to see who owns this data that the Obama campaign has built because the DNC does not own it. Um, but uh, I, I don't think that uh, our failings as a campaign uh, were, can be uh, credited to technology. I don't think it's that simple. In a way, I wish it was. I mean, I think we had larger problems. I think we had message problems and, you know, larger issues. Um, but clearly, they're, they're at a better place than we are. It's not surprising. Um, mm -hmm. it, it is expensive. Um, I think you're going to get a much more level playing field. Um, I, it, I, I think we'll be there's plenty of tech-heavy Republicans. And, I mean, Carl, uh, lo uh, we, we all love data. We're, we're sort of data geeks. And, we can, and um, I think that there will be a tremendous effort put on it. Um, but who was going to do that before? No campaign could do that. You're trying to win a primary. I mean, you've got, <coughs> you know, 35,000 votes in Iowa. Is so you going to go build a national database? I don't think so. Um, and one of the, I thought, uh, you know, very telling self-criticisms of the Republican Party study was that the party should be doing more of that. But, you know, the party was in turmoil. There was new, new leadership that came in. I think the party will do that now, and that'll be good. Um, you know, you need competing systems because, you know, whatever we think is going to be the best technology in three and a half years, we have no idea. So that technology hadn't been invented yet. In the same way that, you know, four years ago, text messaging was going to change the world, well, you know, and Twitter was more important this year. We don't know in three and a half years uh, what that technology will be. And we need that. It's, it's good to have different efforts out there competing and doing different systems. 
you know, after 2000, uh, we, we went down at the very end in the, in, the, in the campaign. So we started this thing called 72-hour program. And the test for the 72-hour program was actually right here in Mississippi in Haley's race. And it was uh, in DeSoto County. Um, because DeSoto County was a county that was seen as having lost uh, the governorship for Republicans four years earlier. And it was a perfect place to test because nobody was running much television up there. And it was a turnout operation. And you could go into DeSoto County and uh, test door-to-door uh, -door technology, different voter contact technology for the last 72 hours. And impact, and see what the impact of that was versus controls in other counties like Hines where you're not doing it. And we we're able to increase turnout in DeSoto County for Haley. I forget the exact numbers, but something like 30%. And that's where we test drove what we then used in 2002 and then 2004 in the, um, uh, for the 72 hour program. So there'll be a lot of that going on. Um, and I, I, think, I think it'll be very positive. Last question. What's the future for Stuart Stevens? And oh. will you run another campaign? Um, I, I, yeah, no, I'd like to uh, keep doing races. You know, I'd like to keep doing what I'm doing. I'd like to keep writing. I am writing. Um, and uh, uh, keep, keep involved in politics. I'd like more balance in my life. Um, presidential campaigns today are consuming to a degree that it's very difficult to imagine. Um, particularly a campaign like this where we started very small. Um, uh, but uh, it, it's a great privilege to be involved in something like a campaign. Um, losing sucks. Um, but um, you know, you come to realize at a certain level in politics that the pain of losing is much greater than the pleasure of winning, and you have to accept that um, and decide if you still want to keep doing it. Um, you get over winning pretty quickly. You don't get over losing. Um, but if you realize that and you keep wanting to do it, then it means you still want to do it. Um, so I'll, I would like to still keep doing what I do. We really appreciate your insights and your coming. Oh, no, thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you. Thank you.